Hi, hi, everybody. We're socially distancing, and these are our masks. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, wait a minute. This is I can't do this. Let me get this off. Hang on. Hey, everybody. <laughs> it's us. It's us. I am Mike Haber, and I am Mike Mizgleski from. Mike and Mike, the underwater photo school, as started by Jim Church, the amazing. Um, thank you all for coming. And we know it's been kind of rough, especially not being able to get in the water these past couple of months. And hopefully that'll change soon. But um, in the meantime, maybe we can share with some experience and uh, see if uh, we can help out uh, in this dry period. So uh, what's our subject for today? Uh, I thought it might be on uh, Polish salami, ah. but then we got, uh, we got nixed out of that. So we're actually going to talk to you guys about uh, compact cameras. Um, but before we do, just a little bit of a, of a history of uh, Mike and Mike. We, um, we actually started teaching on the aggressors back in 1988 uh, under the great Jim Church. He, um, he, when they talk about the guy that wrote the book, he's the guy that wrote the book. So we started on the Cayman Aggressor 2. Uh, Mike and I would alternate helping Jim out. And um, we eventually took over from Jim in 2003 after he passed away. And we've been doing this on the Aggressor, Mike and I, since, uh, since then. And we're, uh, we're loving every minute of it. We're grateful that the, the, the fleet has expanded to so many de distant destinations. Uh, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, no. I'm. Uh... Mike Haber, we both came from uh, New Jersey originally. Can you tell? <laughs> well, we both started diving in the mid-70s. Uh, my first picture underwater was 1979. So uh, somewhere along the line, uh, old. we learned, yeah, we learned how to, we learned how to take a, a, a reasonable picture underwater. And what we're trying to do is share that information with you guys. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Okay, let's, uh, let's do the sharing of the desktop. Let's see, share the screen, share the desktop. We're gonna go on play with this. And here we go. So, fun with Mike and Mike while staying dry. Today we're gonna talk about compact cameras, um, uh, also known as point and shoot cameras. So there's folks out there that may already have a camera system. There's maybe folks out there that are looking to purchase a camera system. There's a, a couple parameters that you want to consider when you're buying a, a system. Okay. First being budget. You want to you want to look in your pocketbook and see how much money you want to particularly spend on a camera system. So what we've done here is we've just given you a few of the options that are available. Um, Clearly, if you're in that high range where you want to spend a lot of money, uh, then this conversation is probably not going to be of interest to you. It's those folks who are maybe in the first two areas, uh, less than $500 or $500 to $1,500. This is going to be really in your alleyway. Keep in mind, too, that you can also pick up some good deals on um, previously owned systems where the person has decided to upgrade. Because a lot of people, they decide to upgrade at the drop of a hat. So you could get a really pristine system for a lot less money than you would have if you had spent brand new. Another factor to consider is your interest in underwater photography. What, what is it that you want to come out with? Do you want to come out with uh, just some quick snaps, you know, vacation shots, you know, here and there? Uh, do you want to document the fish? Or are you looking for those wall-worthy, inspiring images? You know, those are the things that are also going to, coupled with the budget, decide on what it is that you're going to buy. And the last thing, certainly not the least, is your equipment. How much equipment are you going to want to tolerate? You want something small and easy? Small and easy. Mm. <laughs> That's what people call me. Um, you want something small and easy that you can carry around uh, hand luggage? Something flexible, not bulky? Or... Or do you want all the bells and whistles? Yay. You know, something that's going to require maybe another piece of, of luggage. Uh, traveling around the world, it becomes more and more difficult as airlines tighten down on, on their 
uh, requirements as far as luggage is concerned. So sometimes the big cases become a little bit more expensive to, uh, to take with you around the world. True that. Anyhow, these are all things to consider. Uh, talk to your salesman about uh, what your, your goals are. Talk to your friends that are also into underwater photography or even rent before you, um, before you actually uh, buy something. Of all the aggressors, um, most of them have camera systems that are available for rent and uh, we're actually gonna see some of them um, in a few seconds. So. Hey, Mike and Mike, we have our first question. What do you guys oh. think about uh, iPhone housings for underwater scuba? Have you seen these new ones that have been coming out for iPhones? I have, uh, we have, um, not actually to, to touch and to hold, but uh, we've seen the ads and we've seen the, the re press releases and things like that. If, if that's something that's important to you, then you're looking at more of the snaps uh, type of a photograph, okay? You're gonna get some good things, but it's, it's something that's, that's not designed to allow you to do things that you see in the magazines, like on the magazine covers. Nothing wrong with that. I, I mean, for, there's a lot of people that all they want to do is shoot it and post it right away as soon as they get onto on the surface. Great. Uh, anything that extends our capability to show people that don't go underwater what it looks like, we're all for it. Just don't try and make it do something it can't do. How'd that sound? Everything? Yep. All right, move on. Moving on. So the compact systems that we're going to talk about today, also called point and shoots. Basically, they are smaller systems that are generally not so much money, even though we can spend a lot of money on these things. And, and they're, they're designed to be able to be a little bit more portable, okay? Some of them are actually designed to go in the water without a housing, like that Olympus TG6. Um, but anyhow, um, let's get on and talk about our major enemy, the thing that all camera systems have, um, against them, and that's water. Water is our enemy because it's destined to... Water wants to kill you. <laughs> we, need, we need very sophisticated equipment to go and stay in the water and not die. It also wants to destroy our equipment. Okay, you can look at the pictures here and you can see that water has gotten into these systems a little bit and there's a, a fair amount of corrosion. So we have to be very scrupulous about making sure that our water is, our cameras are in uh, tip top condition. So uh, the water doesn't intrude at all. Okay. But it also more importantly wants to destroy our picture. It can take a colorful scene that we see and just fade it out into a blue green because the more water between us and the subject, the less crisp, the less clarity, the less color we're gonna see. Also, the deeper we go too. So how do we make good pictures underwater? Well, we're gonna come back to the color in a minute, but let's talk about making the picture first, okay? It all depends on us being able to understand what it is that the lens sees. Here we've got three different scenes in front of us. We've got a, what we call a wide angle shot, where it's a scenic with all the fish and actually some wreckage in there. We've got a medium shot of just a single fish. And then we've got a, a shot of the little weeny weeny stuff that uh, we see underwater. There's no camera system in the world that can take all three of those pictures without changing something in between the pictures. Okay, and it's all based on what the lens sees. So we can change what the lens sees a number of different ways. One way is to use uh, a conversion lens. Now, the example I'm showing here is a wide angle conversion lens, and that lets the lens see a really big picture area, and we can screw that lens onto the housing, and it will, uh, it will let the, the, the lens on the camera see that big picture area. Now, the advantage of a, of a lens like that is it is something that goes on top of the housing. It's what we call a wet lens. And the wet lens can be removed underwater. So you can go from a wide angle view where you're shooting bigger subjects, getting in close, but then all of a sudden you want to do a fish portrait you know, something like a grouper. And it allows you to remove that lens 
not damage anything. No water is going to intrude in either the lens or the housing. And, and you're now capable of shooting not so wide angle and get in a little bit tighter to take your uh, fish portrait pictures. Right. Another way we can change what the lens sees is that some lenses have um, a feature built into them where they can zoom. And zooming would be changing going from a wide to not so wide, either by pushing a button and it's a motor inside the camera that changes what the lens sees or by turning a ring that changes what the lens sees. But, but this is a means of us to change what the lens sees by zooming. Okay. Now, before we go a little further, when we take a look at that, at that little diagram on the left where we see the zoom button or, or the zoom lever on the top of a point and shoot camera, remember, for the most part, these cameras were never designed specifically for underwater photography. They were, they were designed for general photography. So what you're going to discover as you start to take a look at different point and shoot or compact cameras is that they never go naturally wide enough to satisfy our requirements as, as underwater photographers. You're, you're likely to require a supplementary lens like our wide angle adapter to be able to achieve the kind of wide angle pictures uh, that you see in magazines. However, those compact cameras go very, very deep into telephoto, okay? Because people use them topside. People want to take a picture of, of that duck across the lake, you know, something far away. And that's not really what we need underwater. We don't need the telephoto side but they may have a very nice macro capability built into the system. And speaking of the macro, um, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but we wanna reprise our uh, statement before about water being our enemy, okay? So here we see two pictures, both of sharks. Both the sharks are about the same size in each photograph, okay? but. This first shark, because I had a camera that didn't have a wide angle lens like Mike was talking about uh, just a, a moment ago, I had to back up. I had to get back away from the shark far enough so that I wouldn't cut the shark off in the picture and I could get the whole shark's body in, in the frame. Now, by doing that, what did I also do? I also put more water between me and the shark. Water is our enemy. Water wants to degrade our picture. By putting on that wide angle lens, now we see a really big picture area. Now we can be closer to the shark. Now we can get the entire shark's body in the frame and not be as far away. In this case, that shark was almost touching distance away from, from my camera, okay? So by having that shark in closer, now I have less water between me and the subject. I have a sharper, crisper, cleaner, more colorful image. Now, in this particular picture, there's an artificial light source being involved in order to bring color back into the picture. But let's say there wasn't, okay, and it was natural light, just like the previous picture of the shark was. The difference between those two pictures would have been, once you remove some water between you and the subject, you are making that subject sharper. So you're adding clarity to the picture that you wouldn't have if there's a great amount of water between you and the subject. Yep, 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 yep. And we're gonna to touch on the color thing a little later, but uh, just for now, let's just uh, focus on the lenses. No pun intended with the word focus. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna keep that wide angle lens on the camera, but if we're gonna use a wide angle lens, use it right. You can't shoot sharks, eight foot long sharks from 10 feet away because you wind up with a guppy in your frame. Because that lens sees such a big picture area, if you're too far away from your subject, it's gonna look small. So if you're using a wide angle lens and you wanna shoot the big stuff, stay close. That two foot distance away from this particular shark. And, and I don't wanna give you an actual number like two feet, foot and a half, three feet. 
you got to look through the lens and you got to see what the camera is seeing. You got to see what the lens is seeing. You know, look in the corners and see if there's anything that you don't need in the picture. This applies to any type of camera system that you're shooting. Um, I'll freely admit that I stole this from someone, but someone told me once that an artist starts with a blank canvas and adds things to the canvas to make their image. Whereas a photographer starts with everything in front of them and has to take away things that don't belong to their image. That's the same thing that we have to do here with the, with the photography, whether we're shooting wide angle or shooting a, a standard lens or macro. Is there another question pop up call? I see yeah. a lot. Yeah. So uh, one person said, were you using external light or flash on the second picture of the shark? Yes. And we're going to talk about that in a second as to, to what to bring out that extra color. Um, okay. but, okay. but here, you know, where you're a little bit shallower, that, that external color, that external flash isn't going to matter as much. Uh, but the other one where there was a reef scene, for sure there was, there was an external flash. Just to add to what Mike was saying about shooting something further away and, and getting closer, um, one of the things that we repeat over and over and over again on uh, our aggressor classes or during our aggressor weeks is um, if you think you're close enough, get closer. Uh, essentially, you always have to force yourself to move in on the subject. It doesn't matter if you're shooting wide angle, it doesn't matter if you're shooting macro, you want to as much as possible fill the frame with the subject in order to achieve that sharpness, in order to make your external lights more effective in the image. You wanna force yourself to get closer and closer and closer to the, to the subject. And guys, we did have one more question before I go back to yep. my video <clears throat> about the frames a second ago. What time frame should you expect your housings to last? And what's the best maintenance, su maintenance suggestions to prolong the housing's life? As far as time frame goes, uh, it can last forever. Um, chances are your, your camera, your electronics are going to wear out before the housing will, provided you take good care of it. And the best way to take care of any underwater housing is make sure you rinse it and soak it in fresh water, just fresh water. Some people will put additives in it. No, that's not going to do it. If let's say you're on a, a week long uh, aggressor adventure on say the Cayman aggressor. Okay. Um, that fresh water dunk that they give your camera system when you come out of the water and then they put it back on top of the camera table, that's plenty enough for while you're on that trip because during that entire week, that system is not going to dry out. Um, all of the controls are still going to keep that wetness inside them. It may dry out on the outside of the housing, but the inside stuff is still going to be wet. It's going to be like that for a couple of days. And when he says inside stuff, he's talking about inside close to the control uh, shafts, uh, the control knobs, the control dials, uh, the area up to the O-rings. That's going to stay wet. Even when, you, even when you see the outside of the housing looking dry. Right. And then when you get home, this is the time where you take that system, you take that housing, put it in some warm, fresh water, and let it sit and soak for a little while and work all the controls. Whether you turn that control on the trip or not, work the control, turn the knobs, push the buttons, do it for uh, several repeats, dump the water out, do it again. As many times as you can, can deal with uh, having to, to rinse and repeat, that type of thing. And then once you're done, take the housing out, sit it on the, on the uh, table, let it, let it dry, and you can put it away. That will extend the life of the housing immeasurably. And in terms of when it's time to have it serviced, well, you know, um, that's always a tough question. And uh, Mike and I, uh, for a long time, we serviced, serviced Nikonos cameras. We even service, we still service uh, Aquatica housings and Seacam housings. Um, and to be honest with you, it, you can do it every two or three years if you want to just on a, on a number basis. But the, be the time to really know when it's time to do that is when you feel one of those controls getting sluggish. Either it's hard to turn a knob or a button doesn't spring out uh, as much as it did before, you got a problem and you really need to get that housing serviced before 
uh, and you wind up with, with a leak. And what happens is the corrosion builds up around the O-ring. Um, most housings are double O-ring sealed, so you don't have to worry about um, the first O-ring. But once it gets past that first seal, you're, you've got a situation. So um, it, it's best to either do it uh, on a regular basis, like every three years or so, provided you take care of it the way we just mentioned, or if you feel one of the controls sluggish, have that, uh, have that taken care of. Anything to add? No. Excelsior. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what about the, let's say there, there is no uh, wide angle lens in the budget for now, you know, that, that's down the line. Let's just shoot the camera the way it is. Let's use the standard lens. We would look at, we look for type of pictures that would look good, that are about, oops, that are about um, two feet away, let's say, two to three feet away. Look for subjects that fit that frame. Yeah, I mean, if you just get the system, and as Mike said, maybe your budget didn't allow for uh, an additional wide angle adapter. Well, at that point in time, don't try to take shipwreck pictures. Take parts of shipwreck pictures or limit yourself to the thing that those cameras do best. A good compact camera can take as good a picture of, of fish faces, fish portraits, as, as any high-end expensive camera system that you'll see out there. You'll see good, good quality pictures because the camera's capable of, of doing that. As long as you stay in the camera's wheelhouse, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to achieve good things. What's gonna happen is it's gonna be very important when we get a few slides down the road for us to talk about external light sources to be able to achieve the quality of, of images that might grace the cover of a dive magazine or the inside pages of National Geographic. So um, if, you, if you take the tool and take the tool and use it to its advantage, not to something that it can't do, like you wouldn't want to use a screwdriver to hammer a nail into a piece of wood, you don't try and make a camera take a picture that it's really going to struggle with. So you're, if you're using that standard lens, you're looking for things like the groupers that also they make for kind of like an easy subject because you can get close to them um, that two, two, three foot away or the Hamlet where you can shoot with the standard lens. And then there's the little weenie stuff uh, that we also wanna take pictures of. And, and sometimes the camera has a built-in mode for that, macro mode. Usually it's identified with a little flower icon uh, somewhere in the menu system. Or sometimes we actually need another conversion lens. This time it's a macro lens, which um, is basically nothing more than a really fancy magnifying glass but it lets the camera get close to the little stuff so that the little stuff fills the frame. So whether we're shooting seahorse or feather dusters or nudibranchs or whatever, okay? Flamingo tongues. Flamingo tongues, um, those type of things. We don't wanna shoot them from standard distance away because we could, I mean, they'll be in focus, but they won't fill the frame. So the person's gonna look at the picture and they're gonna scratch their head and wonder what it is you want them to look at. But if we can get close to it and have it fill the frame, then the viewer knows, oh, that's what you want me to look at, that seahorse or that uh, feather dust, okay? In the beginning, when we start with a system or maybe start with underwater photography at all, maybe we don't have a lot of experience with underwater photography. One of the things that, that Mike and I recommend to, to people on our weeks is go for the low hanging fruit. There are a lot of different animals, a lot of different things that we can photograph that don't run away from us. Things that make really good colorful subjects, okay? But they're, but they're fairly common. And that, that commonness is, is what makes them really, really good subjects because we can hone our craft on things that, that aren't trying to hide, that aren't trying to get away. Uh, you find a nice moray eel that's already sticking his head out of the hole and he's not going anywhere for a while. What a perfect subject for us to be able to stay in place, take, take a number of pictures, try different lighting, try different angles, 
but uh, always keep in mind that the common subject is not necessarily a bad subject. Right. We want to be able to work on our skills. And those are the kind of things. And Mike talked about a grouper. We go places in the Caribbean, Cayman, Turks and Caicos, where we find uh, the Bahamas, where mm. we find grouper that, that come to us, that are friendly, that, that want to be in the picture, so to speak. And so we work with that much rather have a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of a very common subject than uh, struggle to get something that, that is, is a little bit tougher to, to photograph, maybe, uh, uh, you know, something that, that hides, but oh, not a, a lot of people. A reticulated osteopod. Exactly. Something, something like that. Oh, nobody's got those pictures. Well, there's a reason nobody's got those pictures, because they hide from you. So go for the low hanging fruit. That's true. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys, you wanna take a couple questions? Sure. All right, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Some of these things you may be talking on further along your slideshow, so just feel free to say we're gonna to touch on that if that's the case. Um, David wants to know, uh, how do you keep water spots from drying on a wide angle lens? I've been advised to clean the lens with then coat with lemon pledge. What do you advise? Uh, I have yet to go through a manufacturer's manual or support site that said anything about using lemon pledge on, on glass. If the glass has a coating, you don't know what kind of coating it has on it, and you don't know if something like that is going to uh, damage the coating. So um, water spots are usually noticeable at the surface when it's dry. But once you get underwater, they, they tend to disappear. Now, um, I'm not saying don't worry about them. Um, water spots occur because you have either rinsed it and something has been left behind and it's dried on the dome or, or that port and, and that's your problem. Okay, so if you, if you really wanna be cautious about it, if you really wanna be, um, uh, careful not to get the water spots. As soon as you take it out of the rinse, dry off the glass and cover it up so it doesn't get any more water spots on it. I'm very hesitant uh, in terms of putting stuff on um, uh, glass, coat, especially coated glass products that uh, I don't know if the manufacturer would recommend. Now, that said, there are people that will take over and under shots with wide angle dome lenses. And you can you could possibly do it with the compact camera, but generally you, you see it more with bigger domes because the bigger the dome uh, is, it, the easier it is to split the the um, the water be, uh, between the top and the bottom. Now in that case, water droplets on the on the dome will show up in the air pit part of the picture. Okay, these are water droplets, not water spots. So in that case, people would use like a um, a, 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 a rain X or, or photo flow. We used to use photo flow a lot, which was the final step that you would put the film in so that the water would sheet off of it. But uh, in that case, you would use something like that to, um, to let the water droplets not stay on the lens, but sheet off. Um, so when in doubt, I would try and find someone who has experience with what that lens uh, is. Uh, or I would try and contact the manufacturer themselves. But uh, to keep the lens spots off, make sure, like I said, once you take it out of the water and you get it all rinsed off in fresh water, you dry it off real good so that um, it doesn't have a chance to form. Okay, living in Florida, we have the advantage of being able to uh, rinse our, our, our dive gear and our equipment gear outside 12 months a year. And so, I have a dedicated garbage can just for my camera system. So I'll come back from a trip. I'll sit down at the dining room table. I will put the system together just as I had on the trip. I will put it in my dedicated garbage can filled with water. I will work all the controls um, that, that are on the system so that any residual salt water now is removed from inside close to the, the O-rings, <clears throat> the, uh, the control O-rings, and I will just let it sit there 
okay? So don't let it sit there for 24 hours, okay? So I've done it uh, in the morning of, of a Tuesday, Wednesday morning, I go outside, I take it out of the, out of the water. I will then have a drying table off to the side, away from the cats to avoid the cat hair. <laughs> but before I leave that drying table, I will take a microfiber cloth and I will wipe down and, and dry the dome port or the flat port in order to get the water droplets off of it um, before I allow the rest of the system to dry. That's the only thing that I ever do in order to, to do that. Now, you're on a boat, it's a different story. You get a, you get a little dunk in between the dives and then two hours later, you're back in the water and you realize, oh, I forgot to wipe off the dome and you get a little bit of, of, of water spotting on your port. I jump in the water, I take my hand and, and, I, and I kind of wash off that, that port underwater. Now that's an important thing to do uh, for a couple of reasons. Sometimes underwater, especially with a wide angle port, you might swim over another diver and bubbles will collect on the port. And then you're taking pictures and you've got air bubbles adhered to the, to the port. So it's not a bad idea every once in a while to just rub your hand across the port, either to get, uh, either to get uh, dry um, bubbles uh, or rather uh, water spots off of it or, or bubbles. Yeah. yeah. And, and where I wouldn't do it here because my hands are dry and the glass is dry, um, you know, and I'm gonna smear up the lens, that doesn't happen when you're in the water and you've got a water surface. There's, there's always a bit of water between your fingers and the lens and that works fine. Yep. Did that answer the question? It does. <laughs> right, and then some, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, what's your opinion on using compressed air on uh, the aggressor boats to dry camera housings off? That's a, that's a really, really good question. And, and one of the things we talk about in the first lecture that we give before anybody's gotten the water is there's no advantage to, to using compressed air. Um, and there are plenty of disadvantages. The disadvantage, number one, is if your camera's already wet, obviously you've gone for a dive. You can drive, now the aggressors keep the, the, the air uh, pressure low on those tanks. So you're not likely to do this thing. Although if you're, if you're on a non-aggressor vessel, which I can't possibly understand why you would ever wanna be, you might have a really higher pressure hose available, you can actually drive water down below that first O-ring seal on, on, your, um, on your control shafts, maybe even beyond the second one. And, and if there's any salt water in there, the salt water crystals are gonna dry in between dives and it may give you a path for a little bit of water leakage. The other disadvantage is on our boats, we've got a lot of a lot of photographers. On our trips, it's photographers, photographers, photographers. So when you're at the camera table, you are going to be opposite and, and catty corner to another photographer who may have his system open to get a card. If you're not careful, there is a possibility that you could actually spray water from that hose off of your camera system into another person's camera system. And, and that's not a very polite or good thing to do. What we do when we come up is we simply take a deck towel, not a, not a deck towel, camera table towel. Most, most of the boats have, have a stack of microfiber towels or you just bring some small 16 by 16 inch microfiber towels with you and blot off the water. Um, camera systems are designed to open up if they're a little bit wet to bleed the water away from the inside of the system. So if, if you have um, blotted the camera pretty well, there's, there's no reason for you yeah. to have to use the, the air. And, and if, uh, if for some uh, unforeseen reason, a drop of water did get into the system, 
It's fresh water. It came right out of the rinse tank. So just blot that off with a Q-tip. You stand more of a chance of water getting into your system when you reach over and you didn't think about rinsing off your hair and now the stuff is gonna be dripping off of your head. Well, I don't have to worry too much about that, but anyhow, um, don't use the compressed air like Mike said, just use a, uh, a towel to just, just dry off the back of the system. It doesn't have to be bone dry um, uh, in order, or desert dry in order for you to, to open it up. Okay, um, next question says, uh, when I try to get close enough and I try to zoom in, it tends to blur about 50% of the time. Any tip about that? She did not include what camera she's using. Yeah, chances are um, you've got a camera that can't focus in that close. So it might need a little bit of that extra help with that macro conversion lens. The other thing too, is that if a camera has a macro uh, system or a, an internal macro capability, you have to read your manual. And, and the manual is gonna tell you whether or not the macro works at full wide or at full telephoto. Right. If the macro works at full wide and, and then you start to telephoto, you've actually changed the optics that the, that the system was designed to use to get macro. Okay, so if it was at full wide where you could achieve the, the absolute closeness, then, then that's what you have to stay with in order to, to get those little tiny subjects. And you know what? You don't even have to test that underwater. You can do that on land right now without having to get on, on an aggressor, okay? Take your camera and try and shoot little things. Um, doesn't even have to be in the housing, okay? You, might, you, you can't do that so much with the wide angle adapters on, on dry land, but you can do that with the close up and just test it and see how close you can get to some, some things, how, how, how big uh, you can get little things to go. That's, that's one good way to occupy some time while we're waiting to get on another aggressor trip. Also, uh, especially if you're coming on a trip with us, uh, but for, your, for yourself, no matter what trip you're doing, always bring your, your manuals, the manuals to the equipment that you're using, yeah. the manual for the camera, the manual for whatever light source you have, the manual for your housing, but the manual for your camera is critical. And most cameras, <clears throat> you, you can actually download a PDF right. of, of that manual from, from the manufacturer's website, right. which, is, which is frankly better preferable, yeah. because, because then you can do a search for specific things that you're looking for, as opposed to having to leaf through the actual book. Yep. All right, guys, I'm going to, for the, the for time's sake, I'm going to ask one more question and then let you guys get back into the uh, PowerPoint. And, okay. Uh, and then we'll try to answer all these questions. We've got a lot coming. Yeah, we, we, we're almost done with the, we're almost done with the, uh, the slideshow here. Okay. How often should you grease an O-ring? I'm going to go ahead and hop off the camera. Uh, oh, okay. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically there's, there's two kinds of ways that an O-ring will seal a surface. And for the most part with compact cameras, we're talking about O-rings that, that seal the back of the camera that- uh, Side seal, it's a side seal. Okay. All right. So, so you've got a compression kind of, of fit with the O-ring where a flat back surface goes up against the O-ring and squeezes it in order to be tight. And then there's the more common slidey surface, which Mike is, is talking about. Yeah, you know what? Why don't we uh, finish that, get, get back to that one when we finish up the slideshow. That way we can go full screen and we can show you what we're talking about. But, but basically, in a nutshell, the ones that slide across the ceiling surface tend to require um, O-ring grease uh, more frequently than an O-ring that goes against a flat surface. But we'll, we're going to show you that yeah. in a few minutes. <clears throat> Keep going. We're going to go. We're going. So um, we're going to finish off with color. You know, what about color? Uh, someone had asked earlier, did, I, did we use a strobe in one of the pictures? And yes, in that case, we did to bring the color back. But, but how do you get the color back? You got that water being an enemy type of thing. So there's three basic ways to get color back. The first is to shoot shallow. And by shallow, we're talking about uh, shallower than 
say 15 feet, maybe like in a 10 foot range. That way there's not a lot of water to suck up that color from the sun and you're able to get some color back into, um, into, the, into your image. The second way is with a filter. And there's two basic types of filters. Now, some of the compact cameras were actually designed to shoot underwater. Um, throughout the years, they've actually gotten better at it. And in this case, we're looking at, again, we're looking at the uh, Olympus, the TG6. And, and it actually has an underwater mode. You can see that with the little fish on the, on the uh, mode dial. And as a matter of fact, there's actually four variations of that underwater mode in the menu. But it all basically comes down to doing it electronically. It's gonna change the white balance, it's gonna change some of the contrast or, and, and things like that because it, 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 uh, it's taken into effect, into consideration that you're underwater. And depending upon how deep you plan on taking those pictures, that's why it, it varies the, the, the mode four different ways, okay? The other type of filter is an actual filter. So here we see two different types of filters that will actually screw onto the front of the housing and it'll color the, the image that the camera sees in front of it. Now we see two different colors because sometimes the water is the same color. You know, sometimes we're in nice blue Caribbean type water. Sometimes we're in green off of New Jersey water like we used to start our diving career in. Um, but basically that's what a filter will do. Now, it has a couple of limitations, serious limitations. One of which is they're only good for a certain range, like say between 15 and 50 feet, okay? Shallower than 15 feet and it's too much filtration. It, 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 there's, there's more color coming from the sun and the filter looks, makes the picture look kind of orangey depending upon which color filter you have. And then deeper than 50 feet, there's not a lot of light um, and the filter cuts back on the amount of light coming in through the lens. So it kind of works against you in that, in that situation. Okay. So, um, uh, we, we tend to use filters for the range and the color of water that they're, that they're best, uh, utilized in. But certainly the best way to put color back into the picture if you're gonna take pictures underwater, is with an artificial light source. Now, the light source you see here and that you see here in this picture is an underwater flash or a strobe, like we like to call it. And in that case, once the cam the minute, the second the camera takes the picture, the flash goes off to send out a really powerful burst of light to light the scene in front of the camera and to put uh, color back um, that the water had stolen. Now, there are limitations, okay? It's only gonna help you up to about four feet. So once you get beyond four feet under, uh, from the subject, that flash is not gonna add color, okay? So it'll work close in, but distance, if you're shooting um, a shipwreck shot and you wanna get the entire shipwreck, turn the strobe off. That's gonna be a natural light picture with sunlight only, not with the strobe. But if you're in close, within two arm lengths away, let's say, then you can use the strobe to add more color. The next one is a constant light source. And in this case, we prefer video lights. Video lights have a nice wide spread so that they will provide light beyond uh, most of, of the field of view of the camera. The reason that we like the constant light source for compact cameras is that the vast majority of the, the less expensive compact, compact cameras do not have a manual exposure mode. Their modes are some form of automatic mode, either uh, aperture priority, shutter priority, or full auto, okay? In which case, the light meter inside that camera is constantly reviewing the light that is in front of it constantly. And so if you were to take a strobe picture without a manual exposure control with just automatic settings, the camera is going to allow the natural light to fill the, the, the sensor. And then on top of that, the strobe is gonna come in and add more light. So you have a strong possibility of an overexposed picture. 
Whereas when you use a video light or multiple video lights, since they're a constant light source, just like the sun is a constant light source, it becomes part of the, the light that the camera is recognizing and the meter is, is measuring in order to take the right exposure. The disadvantage of a video light or a constant light source compared to a strobe is the amount of light, the power of the light is going to be somewhat less. So where Mike was talking about, you can work up to about four feet with a strobe, you really are reducing the, the distance that you can work from a subject with video lights. Mm. So maybe what you wanna do is add a second video light or borrow somebody else's video light in order to add a second video light. The determining factor as to whether or not I spend the money on a strobe is, is can my camera use a manual exposure control? And then the second question is, can my housing reach those controls? Sometimes you buy a camera that has all the controls in the world, but you've got a housing that's not capable of accessing, accessing those, those controls. So you're stuck with the, the automatic settings on the camera, in which case you're way better off using a video light in order to deliver a constant light source that the auto settings in, in a compact camera are capable of measuring. Correct. And then take a class with Mike and Mike. And then take a <laughs> class with Mike and Mike. So anyhow, don't believe us. We've got some examples of pictures that our students actually took on one of our trips here. We've got um, uh, a Sea Life DC 1400 with the wide angle adapter that uh, was shot in Tiger Beach and um, the student got right up to that shark's face and using the wide angle lens, it was able to uh, accentuate the shark's head and make it a, a more menacing type of an interesting picture. Thank you, Mark, for that. Another example, this uh, was shot with uh, an Olympus TG5 with the standard lens, no wide angle adapter, and it was shot with a, a flash and she picked the proper setting. She picked a good subject. She's got it nice and framed with the, with the coral and it, it's just a lovely picture taken with the standard lens and a flash. Here's a, a macro shot with uh, a video light and um, again, Everything was working perfectly. This was with an Olympus TG5 on macro mode and beautiful picture of the Pedersen cleaning shrimp in, in front of the, the uh, anemone. And finally, the, the, the uh, Canon G12 with a wide angle adapter and a grouper in Cayman. Um, Sue shot that and with the strobe, you can see the light from the strobe coming up, but it could also have been done with um, uh, a video light because the, uh, the grouper was able to get so close. So we've got a whole lot more stuff to talk about. We only had an hour to, to do this, actually less than an hour. We've kind of, we kind of rambled on quite a bit. Let's take but, some more questions. But let's take some more questions and maybe get rid of the presentation. I'll stop sharing the screen here. And while Mike's doing that, one of the, one of the advantages too of a compact camera is that a com compact camera system gives you the ability to shoot really nice video. Okay, so, so now here's another advantage of having video lights uh, to shoot your stills uh, and your video, as opposed to using a strobe with a compact camera. You've got the lighting that's capable of doing both at the same time. Yep. So um, just to touch back on that one question that we were talking about with O-rings, when, when should you grease them? When they need it. <laughs> okay, a lot of times people will overdo it. And let me give you an example, no matter what type of an O-ring it is, you came out of the water and you rinsed off your system, you dried it off with a towel, you opened it up and it was dry inside, okay? Guess what? You just performed a pressure test. So why are you gonna take that O-ring off, regrease it, stand a chance of something else going back onto it and then put it back on again. So now you've negated that whole pressure test you did there's no reason to have to wipe the water droplets off of an O-ring. You could close that system right back up again, those water droplets will squeeze right back out and you're not flooding the system, okay? Every time you monkey with an O-ring, you stand a chance of something happening. So 
I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying be very judicious on when you do it. And the amount of grease you need is just enough to make the O-ring slick. Little no. ball bearing size between your fingers. All you're trying to do is make the O-ring slippery, okay? The O-ring grease does nothing to help keep water out. All it does is allow the O-ring to slide along the ceiling surface. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not, but the O-ring on the clear door is actually a side sealing O-ring. So that when it closes, it slides past the inner uh, edge and it seals up against the side. So there you would need a little more grease to get some slide neosity going so that it doesn't bind and, and squeeze out. But if, if you look at, at some of the, the SLR housings where the back O-ring is actually in the bottom uh, or in the front and then the, the, the back of the housing just sits right on top of it, it doesn't slide beyond it, that's not really an O-ring, it's a gasket. So it really needs less grease. It actually doesn't need any grease whatsoever. Yeah. Okay, because grease only stands to attract uh, things that, um, that you don't want attracted to onto an O-ring. So um, don't overdo it, um, but uh, a little bit goes a long way. Got another question? Yes, all right, so Ivan wants to know, this is a good question. What, <clears throat> what about using post-dive photo editing software for color correction, like Dive Plus? How much can you honestly correct for and what really has to be done with white balance and or lights? Well, you know, that's a whole nother uh, hour and a half, two hours of, of discussion. <laughs> but in a nutshell, that, that's a good question. And, and, it's a, and, and this is going to be the type of answer that will help with that. Um, it depends on what your camera is recording. Is it recording a JPEG only or is it recording a RAW file? The difference between the two is that every single digital camera shoots in RAW. They don't all record the image as a RAW file though, because when it shoots in a RAW, it takes in all the data, it processes it in its head, throws away what it doesn't want, and then gives you the picture it thinks you want. Whereas with a RAW file, it keeps all that data. It doesn't do any more processing. It says, okay, here you go, you, you take care of it. And generally speaking, if you set your camera up right, and if, you, and if you're careful about your picture taking, you'll get a good picture right off the bat. But you'll have more of a chance to adjust things, whether you are adjusting to correct or change or to be creative with a raw file than you will with a JPEG. Um, so yes, that is another way of adjusting the color. And you would be surprised at how much a natural light picture taken in raw will all of a sudden pop up into some great color by just adjusting the, the white balance um, in the computer. So we didn't include that in our presentation because that's like another talk, but, uh, but yes, it's, it's actually part of that whole filtering idea. Yeah, maybe we could uh, look to have you guys on again and talk more about the, the white balance and editing and stuff like that. Post-production. I know there's a post-production, there we go. Yeah. Uh, um, here, uh, do you guys like GoPros? And when shooting GoPro, what frames per second do you recommend using while underwater? Uh, yes to the first question. Yeah, and, and 60 frames per second, I like. Uh, it gives you a little bit of flexibility um, with, with action. Uh, but GoPros are, GoPros are great. And, and, and the problem, though, uh, with GoPro is on the still side, uh, you're definitely better off using uh, a constant light source, you know, like, uh, like a video camera. You're never gonna, you're never gonna use any kind of a strobe with a GoPro uh, because it's, it's more of a video camera that will take an occasional still shot as opposed to um, the compact cameras that, that we've shown so far, which are primarily still cameras that will take video. The, uh, the advantage of a GoPro is that it's very simple. There's not a lot of extra stuff you need to add on to it to take some great shots or the great videos. And, and it's just like almost point and shoot. The disadvantage is that there's not a lot of stuff you can add to it. There's not a lot of adjustments you can make. So there's, you're, you might be kind of limited to the, to the type of photography you want to shoot versus underwater uh, video. Yeah, the, the, important thing, the important thing about uh, 
about if you really want to be serious about your GoPro video or stills with a GoPro is get yourself a nice base with mm. handles on either side. Yep. Okay. Start out with, with, with one light. Um, and, and this is, this is important and, and it really should be uh, added to the conversation. And I, we forgot to do it earlier. If you're using the filter, you have to take the filter off when you start to use an artificial light source because the artificial light source is going to de deliver daylight color. And so your, your picture, if you, if you keep your filter on, and, and in most cases, GoPros, people are using for their wide angle shots, they're using some form of a, of a red filter or an orange filter on the front of it. If now suddenly you've moved in and you're gonna take some of those uh, macro shots, get in tight with the GoPro, take your filter off, turn on your, your video light or two video lights in, in order to achieve what you wanna get in terms of color there. Another way around it would be to put a blue gel in front of the light and actually change the color of the light so that the GoPro corrects of the, the lighting color like it's correcting the sunlight color. But when you do that, you cut back on the amount of light the video light can, can, can send out. And the reason I talk about a nice base um, that gives you handles that you can hold out wide is now with this little tiny camera that's that big, there's very little stability if you're just holding that, that system, especially if you're holding it on a GoPro stick. I mean, it, the capability of doing this kind of thing while you're shooting translates into an image that, that does this later on on the computer. So giving you some basis for having stability um, with a handle system like this. And one of the other things I've seen people do and, and I've encouraged people to do is put a weight on the bottom of, of that, that base so that now you've created more mass to the entire system. And, and it's almost like giving you image stabilization uh, with the system. How are we doing on time? Guys, we'll keep on going. We got a lot of questions here, so. All right, we'll go. Yeah, we'll keep on talking. Um, so uh, here's one, uh, let's see. Which I had so much cough medicine before. <laughs> I've uh, quit regularly. I've quite regularly used manual white balance. However, I found it makes the images look rather cold. Any thoughts on adding some more? And just to add, I do use flash or video light as well, but not with MWB. Um, well, that is more of, of an important decision up front if your camera is shooting in JPEG and not RAW. If you're recording raw files, it's almost uh, something that you could change after the fact without losing image quality because of the raw data. Um, I would, without knowing what type of camera you have or what type of flash or whatever, my suggestion to you would be to get to some place underwater where you're happy, where you can't move around, where you like the situation, not looking for a cover shot to National Geographic, just looking for a nice picture, and take two or three different pictures with different white balance settings. Try your, try your manual white balance setting, try your average white balance setting, try sunlight, um, and try shade, okay? Try those uh, settings. And then when you get to the surface and you get them on the computer, take a look at it and see which one you like best. You know, it's, it's, uh, I hope I'm answering this right because, uh, and I, again, I don't know what type of camera system or what you're shooting, but it was kind of like when people would pick Kodak film or Agfa film or Fuji film or whatever, you know, oh, I love the way the, the shades, the reds are displayed in Kodachrome or, oh, I like the blues in Ektachrome. It, it's all a matter of personal taste. So um, that initial setting is going to be based on what you like. But like I said, if you're shooting in RAW, it's almost not, not, uh, not an issue. Yeah, if, if your camera is capable of shooting in RAW, then, then I would put it in auto white balance or in daylight white balance and, and, just, and just go. 
uh, it, it just seems to me that you could be wasting time in the water. You have a limited amount of time in the water by trying to do a manual white balance. Now, if it is not shooting raw, if it is shooting JPEG, then do that, do that same uh, scenario and then pick one that you like because you're not going to have that much of a chance to adjust it if it's not shooting raw. Okay. Now, Laura asks, can you please talk a little bit about the tendency to stop exhaling to reduce bubbles or manage buoyancy while snapping a shot, which then leads to headaches? Skip breathing. Yeah, not a good thing. You know, uh, the first thing that we talk about in our classes in the very first lecture has got nothing to do with the nuts and bolts of photography, but it has everything to do with being a safe diver first. So it's something that you really got to focus on. Again, no pun intended, that you need to be a safe diver first. You need to be able to breathe um, and, and watch your depth and watch your air and then focus on the photography, okay? And, and especially with buoyancy, um, we really get into this. Uh, as a regular diver, it's not a big deal because generally you're just swimming over the top of the reef. You're looking and seeing what's going on. And, you know, you're having yourself a nice dive. But photographers, we get right into it. Okay, We get right down and get in close to that stuff. So we stand more of a chance of damaging and hurting something than anybody else. So we've got to be extra special careful to be, to be neutrally buoyant our entire dive. So we tell people that when you start your dive, start your dive about five pounds negative, And then put a little bit of air in your BC so that you can get your neutral buoyancy. And then as your dive goes on, mm -hmm. as your tank empties, as you get more buoyant, you can let that air out and then return to your neutral buoyancy so that you can move by just a little push off with your index finger or just a little bit of an inhale to come up and swim away so you don't damage what you, uh, what you were in close to and you leave the, the scene nice and clean for the next diver. So um, it, it's more gonna be on, on, on you to, to, to not worry about your bubbles and to, to just breathe and be a safe diver first. Do you recommend burping an external lens when you get to depth? Yes. yes. Uh, doesn't, even, <laughs> doesn't even have to be at depth. I mean, like, let's say you're, you're um, on the aggressor and let's say you're in Little Cayman and let's say you're at uh, um, Three Fathom Wall. Okay, 18 feet, and then you're at the wall and straight down. Get off, get down to the sandy bottom, burp it there. Once you let the air out, okay, it doesn't matter what depth you're at. Okay, just do it when you're stable, when you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, am I going to drop it over the wall or anything like that. But uh, do it as quickly as you possibly can. And then, like Mike said before, if you swim over a diver and their, their bubbles get on the lens, Make sure you're conscious enough to look at it and wipe the front of the lens off too because bubbles will show up on the front as well as on the back part of that head on lens. Okay. Would it be better to get a dedicated underwater camera or housing for a DSLR I already own? Well, I guess it depends on what uh, DSLR you own. Sometimes housings aren't made for every single DSLR. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and then again, it depends on those three things that we talked about earlier, your budget, your, your interest, and how much gear you want to lug around. Okay. Um, if, if you, um, if you have the lenses that are applicable for underwater, let's just say, let's just say you could get by very nicely, uh, with two lenses, a, a, a wide angle zoom, like a 10 to 17 or a 10 to 22. Um, or and a macro lens, like a 60 millimeter micro or macro, okay? Those two lenses will get you like 90% of the pictures that you'd ever wanna take underwater. So if you have those lenses and if you're willing to spend a little bit extra money, a little bit extra money, <laughs> to, uh, to get a housing and the ports and the arms and all of that stuff, well, that's not true because arms and strobes, that's, you're gonna use that with, a dedicated underwater housing to um, camera like what we just talked about. Uh, it's, it's all going to be a matter of, of personal budget and interest in terms of... Also, if, if you've got an SLR and it's a few years old, the likelihood is even if a manufacturer had made a housing for that, 
they're probably no longer in production for that particular system, which now brings you into that, into that previously owned or used market yeah. where you might be able to get a really good deal yep. on, on a housing uh, that somebody had previously uh, used. Um, you know, and they moved up to the newest, greatest, bestest in the world. You know, and, and housings are tanks. <clears throat> right. I mean, the, uh, uh, an SLR housing should should last a lifetime. Yep. Uh, Olympus TG6 best with video lights over strobes. Video lights good with wet with wet wild wet wide angle lens. Video lights with the with the wide angle lens is uh, going to be tough. You probably be better off with two. Uh, and then you'd still got to work in close. Uh, you, no matter what type of lens, if, if you're more than like uh, just beyond your reach away with the video light, it's, it, you, it's gonna, you're going to start to lose um, uh, effectiveness right away. Um, strobes uh, will always probably be a better choice with wide angle in terms of reaching out there and color and coverage. But, yeah. but then it, it comes to uh, understanding what the correct exposure is going to be, which is another reason why you should take a class with Mike and Mike. Right. Um, so um, I don't want to sound I'm being like evasive, but I hope I, I gave you the reasoning and, and what my thought process is, was there. Okay. If you take a flash picture, how far away should you plan to be so the color balance is correct? Does that depend on depth, probably? Um, Flash pictures depends on distance more than depth. Um, depth will, will, will affect your ambient light. It will also affect your background lighting. But if you, I wouldn't try and push a flash much past four feet, which is, uh, let's say, four measured feet or two arm lengths away. I know that sounds kind of close. And, and if it is, like, let's say, five feet away, well, if you're shooting raw, maybe you could bring some of the color back. Uh, on the computer, but um, um, how water will take away color with distance <coughs> as well as with depth. Our, uh, on our trips, if, um, if somebody's never been with us before and they're shooting with strobes, we will take a measurement of the light output of those strobes and then we'll create a strobe chart for them so that in, in a manual uh, exposure setting at a given distance, you know, in the absence of any other light, uh, at, at one and a half feet, it would be this f-stop. At two feet, it would be this f-stop. At three feet, it would be this f-stop. And we never make the chart more than four feet. Okay, because we just, we don't recommend beyond four feet. Okay. Any tips on focusing on large animals in blue background? Example, mantas or sharks that are moving? I cannot get a clear shot without a shadow beneath the animal. You got this one. Read that again. I need to listen to it again. Any tips on focusing on large animals in blue background? Example, mantas or sharks that are moving. I cannot get a clear shot without a shadow beneath the animal. Okay. I'm gonna answer this, I'm gonna answer this fast because to answer it correctly will take another hour. But basically, what we try to do, we're, we're always metering for the ambient background, okay? That has to be right before we do anything else. So let's say we're not going to use strobes. We're just taking an ambient picture, and, and there's a big animal in the picture. More important than knowing what the exposure should be for that big animal we need to know what that exposure needs to be for the blue water. Okay, so we're always measuring for the blue water. Now, let's assume we're adding a strobe to this. The first thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna measure for that blue water again. And then we're gonna adjust our strobe exposure in order to um, not overwhelm or not underwhelm the animal based on the exposure that we got with our blue water. We're gonna to try to get close. Um, the, the part that's, that's tricking me in the question 
is there's always a shadow underneath because I don't know if that shadow is brought upon by um, shooting a natural light picture or there's something in the way that the person has aimed their light. If it's a strobe, then perhaps the answer is lower your strobe in order to deliver more light underneath the subject, which gets into the whole discussion of strobe positioning. But if it's a natural light picture, well, that makes sense because you've got all this light coming in from the top. You're going you're gonna to adjust your exposure for that, that ambient light coming in for the top, which is going to be bright. And naturally, there's going to be there's going to be shadow underneath. The only way to open up that shadow is going to be to deliver light through an artificial light source. Okay. Do you guys use float devices to offset weight? What device? Float devices? Yes. On um, well, I do. You don't. Uh, you kind of muscle on through it. But yeah, but yeah I I've got uh, those little. Um, uh, dense foam uh, on my um, on my arms on the on the on the on the light uh, the strobe arms to, uh, to to offset the weight of the housing uh, less fatigue on the wrist I'm able to uh, control the the housing with ne next to nothing and and it just it just gives me an easier way to, to take a picture absolutely okay can a silicone spray be used on an o-ring out of housing no no, 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 no. Nothing, nothing that the manufacturer doesn't recommend because not only are there different types of silicone greases, there are also different types of O-rings. And, and a silicone spray, um, for one, has some sort of a propellant that may... Well, it might be, a, it might be um, a, pump a, bottle. a pump bottle, which means that right. it's going to be... But, but, but then no. it's not viscous enough. Now you're carrying, now you're traveling with a, liquid. a, a bottle uh, of something that can either spill in your equipment or or it's just taking up a lot of space, whereas uh, a little tiny container of the appropriate O-ring grease should last you a really, really, really long time because you're using so little of it. And only use the grease that the manufacturer recommends because like, like we were saying just before, there are different types of O-rings and different types of grease and not all the same. Like for example, Nikonos, uh, that wasn't silicone. That was uh, a different type of base grease because it was a different type of an O-ring. But uh, ion strobes and, and things like that, those require a different grease. The blue C and C O-rings, that requires a different grease. So just make sure you- know, you... Aquatica has, has a grease that, that they recommend. Right. So I've got Aquatica housing and ion strobes. I've got two little tiny containers of, of O-ring grease that I use for, for each one. Okay. Crazy, huh? <laughs> um, what editing software do you guys recommend? Photo editing or video editing? Why don't you touch on both? Okay. So you didn't specify. Uh, photo editing, um, if you are on a Mac, then I would recommend starting off with Photos. Photos is the program that comes with the operating system. Um, it has uh, great uh, power to, um, to not only catalog your images, but also adjust um, your raw files and your JPEGs, I guess, to, to a degree. Um, from there, uh, I, would, um, I would say uh, cross-platform, you have um, uh, Adobe Lightroom and Phase One Capture One which um, <clears throat> they both do basically the same thing, but it's just going to be a matter of, of, you know, I like chocolate, you like vanilla. Um, Adobe Lightroom is only available as a subscription. Capture One is available both ways, but if you buy it, um, you will not get upgrades. So... Um, well, you get upgrades you get upgrades in between editions. Correct. So, you know, when Capture One 11 comes out, um, for the year or so that it's out, you get the upgrades. But then when Capture One 12 comes out, uh, you have to buy Capture One 12. Right. But it's usually a discounted price because you own right. a previous version of Capture One 12. And it kind of works out almost to be the same here's price. A, here's, yeah. 
here's the real difficult thing about, and, and, and I've got on, on my traveling laptop probably a half dozen editing softwares uh, that, that I buy all the time in order to look for the perfect underwater photography editing software. And, and the biggest thing that we will do in editing our, our images is get rid of backscatter, okay? All of the systems are capable of, of uh, adjusting uh, exposure, light balance, light balance uh, our, our shadows, our highlights, all of that stuff. It doesn't matter. They all do it well. It all depends on what you like. But now the real thing becomes, I'm now taking a picture in turbid water and I've got a whole bunch of little white spots in the picture that I need to get rid of. Now, of, of the ones that are available today, Lightroom does that the best, um, and, and, and I'm qualifying that because I don't think it does it really, really, really well, but it does it the best of, of all of them that are out there. Right now, the, the best option is you start with one of those, you don't do any of your, your repairs on, until you're, you're done with every other um, correction that you've had to do, and then you export it into something like Photoshop and use the tools in Photoshop to get rid of those spots. That is not a perfect solution. So I still hold out hope that one day um, we're going to be able to get one software that does that particular item really, really well, because it's the, it's, it's the one thing we spend the most time on a photograph. I can take an image and do all of the other color corrections and shadow and all the, the, all the detail kind of stuff. I can be done with that in 10 minutes and then spend an hour on getting rid of backscatter. Okay, so right now, um, you know, most people I guess are, are using Lightroom. Um, I, don't have, I don't have one that I say, go get them, that's the one. I don't think, I don't think any of them are perfect yet for uh, underwater photographers. It used to be that Aperture was, was our choice, but Apple stopped developing it and uh, the latest operating system doesn't support it anymore. So um, you're stuck there. But uh, uh, if you do go on the Lightroom subscription, you for the photographer subscription, $9.99 a month, you get both Lightroom and Photoshop. And Photoshop is there only for like Mike was talking about, uh, the, the cloning and the spotting tools. Okay, guys. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, would you guys tell us uh, what uh, Mike and Mike weeks you guys have coming up on the aggressor? Well, that's kind of fluid, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the next one that we know that hasn't been canceled yet is uh, June uh, 26th, 27th, uh, Turks and Caicos. So it's June 27th to July 4th. We, uh, Galapagos, if that goes out in August, that's sold out, so. Um, yeah, and, and the way we set up our schedule for this particular year, it turns out that July's kind of open. So uh, keep your eyes peeled to uh, Aggressor's website because now that we've had some that, that we couldn't complete, um, we're, we're likely gonna tr see if there's the opportunity for us to, uh, to get uh, to add, to, to add some extra uh, dates. Yeah. dates in there to make up for the opportunities that, that uh, we haven't been able to fulfill. But I will say this, um, uh, September 9th to the 19th, we have a 10-day Bahamas trip, uh, which is going to do the Southern Bahamas. I, for, I love the Southern Bahamas. It is gorgeous. The water's warm. It's clean. There's a lot of great stuff there. So if you wanted something close in the Caribbean, man, you can't beat it. And we have space open on that. We also have space open on our October 9th to the 19th Raja Ampat uh, aggressor trip, which is amazing photography, especially if you're into the little stuff. Um, so um, for sure, watch those two and uh, check out our, our site on the aggressor, our page on the aggressor website. 
and you'll see when we were able to add some more for um, maybe after September this year. Okay, well that's good. You can also follow these guys on Facebook at Mike and Mike School of Underwater Photography. Um, we do have uh, upcoming uh, Zoom sessions. May 7th is our next one, Richard Weiss, PBS and Born to Explore. May 14th, welcome aboard the new Philippines Aggressor with Aaron Lerman, the owner and CEO of Aggressor Wayne Brown. May 19th, ship shape and ready for your next adventure of a lifetime with Aggressor Adventures Operation Team. And on May 21st, uh, the ish of fish and how to know any fish you meet with Samantha Whitcraft, conservation biologist. And we just added as of this morning, uh, May 26th, Michael Richardson from Patty. So I hope to see you guys all there. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Appreciate Stay safe. It. Stay safe. Stay healthy.